Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA Network Plus Certification Training Course, the online training course with smarts and good looks. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to talk about configuration management documentation. This comes from N10-004, our Network Plus exam, section 4.2, where we need to identify all of these different kinds of documentation, wiring schematics, physical and logical network diagrams, baselines, policies, procedures, and configurations, and regulations. So it's important not only to have our network and understand how it all works together, but you also need to have this configuration management documentation as well. It becomes very important whenever you start getting into some of these larger environments, some of these things where there is an institutional knowledge. There's one guy who knows how this works. Bob knows where that wire goes, and only Bob happens to know. The bad part comes when Bob isn't there. Bob goes on vacation. He's somewhere in the middle of nowhere. He doesn't have a phone. There's no way to get in touch with Bob. Do we all just sit around until Bob gets back? That doesn't make a lot of sense. We need to have some way to document what's there on our network. If you have somebody come into your environment who's a brand new team member, this is a great thing to have them do. Have them document parts of the network that we don't have any information on today. They're going to learn their way around. They're certainly going to learn about uh, the way the network is put together and how it's laid out. And that person oftentimes becomes someone who knows a lot more than anybody else does about how things are put together because they've sat in the room and tracked back the wire and wrote down exactly where, where it went. They happen to know more about the infrastructure than anybody else, and they just got here. You also want to be sure you standardize on where this documentation goes. It does no good to create all of these docs and nobody has any idea where they might be located. So usually there is a central server, a central share somewhere, and you'll have rights and permissions for the help desk, for your management teams. The people that need that information can then get to it. And if there's a crisis, if something goes wrong, if there is a problem that somebody needs to resolve, they now know exactly where to go to get their hands on this documentation. Wiring schematics is a great piece of documentation because now we need to understand how devices are connected to each other. And this is usually a very, very detailed description of exactly how these wires are configured. This is one example of a wiring schematic where we are looking exactly inside the ports themselves at what's connected to where. Sometimes you get these schematics from a manufacturer. They're giving you a cable and they'll tell you on this cable, pin 1 connects to pin 10 on the other side. If you're not quite sure, you can't get in touch with a the manufacturer, there's no wiring schematics, sometimes you can reverse engineer it by using a multimeter and just make sure you have a continuity test to figure out pin 1 goes to, where's it go? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you get down to 10 and it beeps and you know, aha, pin 1 is connected to pin 10. Let's see if it's connected to any other pins. No, okay, we'll go to pin 2 and do the exact same thing over and over again until we've made our own wire schematic of what's inside of there. Now, a wire schematic may also represent what's inside of a closet, for instance. If you've ever worked inside one of those closets where you've got patch panels and switches and routers and a lot of other devices, you may need to know when a patch comes off the patch panel and the wire connects to another device, you may want to have that documented. So it's a good idea that if you know or want to know what's going on inside of that closet, that you have a wiring schematic of how everything there is laid out. Most organizations will have some standard numbers. And if you go out to the jack that's by someone's office, you'll see a number on the jack, and that will usually correlate to a patch panel or to a jack that's inside the wiring closet so that you can then track it from point to point to point to point. If you're working a lot with fiber connections, you often do always document the fiber came from this patch went to another patch. And that becomes really important, especially because fiber loses its signal as the light goes through. And you have to keep track of how much light you're getting on the other side. Again, make sure you're organized. Make sure you have that documentation. And make sure it's somewhere that people can get their hands on it. There's also a need for physical network diagrams. It's important to have a layout of exactly what's connected where. Now, this can include this picture here, where we don't know exactly what building these things are in. In some cases, we do, because it has a building name on it. We're not exactly what floor it's in. But if you're trying to figure out how you're going to use different things on the network, it's nice to know exactly what router is connected to what firewall is connected to what other router, which is connected to what core switch. And you can then go and track back inside of that room or 
inside of that facility exactly where these things might be located. If you do need a very detailed diagram of that, you can often combine that with something like this, a very detailed picture that shows switches and routers and firewalls and servers that are physically in the rack. And if you went into the room and you looked at that rack, it would look exactly like the drawing that we have here. Sometimes you don't need to know the details. You just need an overall view of what's going at the very high level. And you can use something like a logical network diagram where you have a high level view of what's going on. So if I wanted to start asking questions about our wide area network and how it's connected and where it's connected to, I know that for instance, at Miami coming out of our corporate MPLS cloud, we correct, uh, connect directly to the Miami office, which is then directly connected to our Miami branch. Our Miami branch doesn't go directly into our corporate cloud. Now, I don't know what routers are there. I don't know what switches are there. I don't know anything else about it. But I know functionally at a very high level, logically, the flow across our network. I know if I want to look at Two Egg Florida and see where they're connected, they just have a single branch and it's directly connected to the cloud. And I can start asking questions and getting questions answered about these network connections, bandwidths, what are we using on those links and things we may want to do in the future. If you've ever wanted to play what if on your network, or you're wanting to know if it's okay to add yet another application onto a wide area network, you may want to do something called a baseline. And a baseline will create either over a very short time frame or over a very long time frame an idea of how traffic has flowed on the network. Baselines have a lot of different forms. It's a very broad topic. You need to figure out what the baseline means for you. Do you need to baseline the way an application is performing? Do you need to baseline response times of that application over a day or more? Do I need to look at network throughput and get a determination of how the network throughput is handled on my network? Different baselines will be used for different things. So that's the first question you'll need to ask. Usually what you're doing is applying a point of reference in time. You're examining data that you're going to collect over a long period of time, relatively speaking, and you're essentially going to be examining the past to give you a perspective of what you're going to be able to do in the future. This is great for planning. It's great to look back on and determine, are we creeping up? Six months ago, this was our network. Today, this is our network. There have been a lot of changes. What have those changes done to response time? What have they done to throughput? Can people use it in the same way? Should we be planning for more bandwidth? Should we put in other routers or split our network up? There are business decisions you can make based on that. And a baseline is a great thing to do to give you the answers you may be looking for. As you can see by this picture, baselines can be extremely detailed. This happens to be a baseline just on throughput, bits per second, total traffic through the network. This is a single day. This is separate weeks. You can see the peaks and valleys as people come into the office and leave. You can see that over an entire month, and you can see that over a year. And based on what type of applications are running in your network, noticed well back uh, earlier in the year, there was a lot of traffic going out of the network. And then it went down quite a bit. And that may have been for many different reasons. But at least now we can see this on the screen very different. If this had kept going until now, it may still be at a high rate. But we can tell based on this graph that we don't need the same type of output going out that we did earlier in the year. And now we can make some decisions based on that and what we're going to do going forward. Policies and procedures sometimes have nothing to do with physical network devices. They have to do with different aspects of how the network is being used. Uh, Infrastructure-wise, from a security perspective, from a network perspective, how do people get access to the network? How do we remove their access from the network? How do we determine what type of access they get and who signs off on that? And those policies and procedures help us get through those configurations. On very large organizations, this is almost always standardized. That way you're making sure you aren't missing anything. Every person who comes into our organization as a new employee has these particular rights on the network. And if they want more, they need to perform this function. Maybe if they come in on the weekend, what type of access do they get? So this is a way to document that part of it so that everybody understands exactly what it is we're trying to accomplish with that standardization. These are usually text-based policies and procedures. They're usually in a book. They're usually online somewhere or in some form that we'd be able to look up if we need to understand what do we do in this particular situation. Sometimes when you're dealing with grabbing configuration information, you can automate the process. What if you'd like to grab the configuration from every single one of your routers in your environment? You may set up a job that goes out at 3 in the morning, goes out to every router, collects all the configurations, uh, collapses them into a single file, and stores them off somewhere for later. And that way, if somebody says, how did we have that router configured six months ago? Oh, I have the router from six months ago. And every day, 
the, since that time frame. We can look and see exactly what happened. So it becomes really useful for change control if you need to go back and revert back to a previous configuration. Sometimes nice to have those configurations saved off as well. Sometimes policies and procedures are created and usually approved by committee. And that always gives you a bad feeling, doesn't it? There's a committee involved. But almost always, especially with policies and procedures, this becomes really useful because now everybody is involved in making sure they know what happens. When a new person comes into our company, what do we do and what rights and permissions? So I need to understand from HR, what do they do to get that person access into the building? What does the physical security folks, do they give them access cards? What do the network security teams provide them access to? And then what does a person's manager manager provide them access to. So you can see there's a lot of different groups, a lot of different people. You don't really have a choice. You have to get everybody in a room to figure that piece out of it. And even though that's a com committee of people, it becomes incredibly important when you're dealing with such different aspects of your environment. Not everybody has to worry about regulations. Some environments don't have as many regulations as others. But if you're an environment that deals with financial or healthcare type issues, then you're probably very aware of a number of regulations that are associated with you even as a networking person. You're probably given some very specific parameters on what needs to be documented. If you're handling somebody's healthcare information, there's a certain type of security you must have towards that. There's a certain way the network must be configured to protect that information. Those very specific documentation parameters are very usually very public. They're sometimes posted in a common area. You can get them on a common website. It's something that everybody is told about. You know about it, and you use those different uh, configuration parameters, those documentation parameters to set up and configure the way you're going to use the network. Often these can be integrated into the business process itself. So every day there's a daily report that reports on the things required from a regulatory perspective. Maybe the, what you report on is then sent to another group, another building, another company itself, just to make sure that you're staying up to date with the regulations. And usually these regulations, especially in some of these large environments like healthcare and finance, have auditors come in all the time just to make sure that you are following every single one of those regulations. So if you want to be sure that you're going to pass that audit, you have to keep your documentation up to date. You have to have some way to verify that what you're doing is following those regulations. And so it becomes extremely important to be very organized and to have all the information you, not, you might need. You don't want to wait until the last minute to try to put things together for an auditor. It's much better if you grab all this information and create it as you go along. Let's see what we've learned about configuration management documentation. Our first question is, what documentation type shows a high-level view of network design? There was one specific kind, and it was called a logical network diagram. Very high level, doesn't give us a lot of details, but it helps us in planning. You need to know the pinout information for a router cable. What type of documentation do you need? Well, that would be a wiring schematic. So you can know exactly the way that that router cable is configured, and you may be able to build one later on based on what you have in your documentation. And finally, what type of documentation can provide information such as network traffic usage over time? Well, what we want to create in that case is a network baseline and be able to understand from six months ago until now, how has our network traffic usage changed? Well, that covers what we needed to know for our configuration management documentation, our section 4.2, where we've gone through wiring schematics, network diagrams at the physical and logical level, baselines, policies, procedures, and configurations, and regulations. Thanks for joining us for this module. If you'd like to see more video modules, participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freenetworkplus.com.